Welcome to The Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about the posterior foramenotomy of the cervical spine, which is removing a bone spur from the back of the neck to create room for a nerve, which is a very common treatment for cervical radiculopathy or pinched nerve in the neck. I'll be posting new videos weekly, so hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. So again, Today we'll be talking about a posterior foramenotomy, posterior from the back of the neck, foramenotomy, opening up the foramen to make space for the nerve. As a reminder, this is what we typically see when a patient has a pinched nerve in the neck. So this is the C6 bone, C7 bone, and there's a bone spur here that is pinching the nerve, narrowing the space. A posterior foramenotomy involves making a small incision in the back of the neck, coming in, and resecting part of the bone here. The most important thing to understand about a posterior foramenotomy is that it is indirect decompression. It's not actually solving the problem, which is the pinched nerve from the front. The only way you can solve a bone spur or a disc herniation from the front is by going in through the front of the neck and directly removing it. That's the ACDF or cervical disc replacement option. The posterior cervical foramenotomy comes in, creates room for the nerve, and the nerve floats back away from the offending agent. So the concept is that not that you necessarily have to treat the problem that's pinching the nerve, but if you create room in the back of the neck for the nerve, the nerve will actually float back. The advantages of a posterior foramenotomy over the anterior procedure is it's a much smaller procedure. The incision is less than an inch long. It can be done outpatient, meaning it's done on the same day. The surgery takes about an hour and the recovery is pretty straightforward. It is not a fusion procedure. We're not putting any implants in the neck. It is simply making a small incision in the back of the neck and removing the bone spur. So here's a pretty good picture of what that looks like. Here's the side of the neck and here's the back of the neck. And the nerve is getting trapped as it comes out. So the posterior aspect, this is the back of the neck. For a foramenotomy, we take a small instrument, a small drill, and create a small opening for the nerve. You'll see that there's a facet joint here and it's basically removing part of the facet joint. Now you cannot remove the entire joint that destabilizes the spine, but you can certainly remove up to half of the joint and that's the concept of a posterior frame anatomy. Once you remove half of the joint from the back of the neck, then the nerve in theory has room. In my practice, there are certain candidates who are ideal candidates for a posterior frame anatomy. Those candidates typically have a pinched nerve without weakness. When patients start getting weakness, I like to address the problem more directly with an anterior cervical fusion or cervical disc replacement because when patients have weakness in the distribution of a nerve, I really need to know that that nerve is totally decompressed. I'm not comfortable just doing a posterior decompression. Patients that also tend to be good candidates for this procedure are patients that get relief with forward flexion of their neck like this because when they forward flex their neck it essentially simulates like that it simulates the opening of the back of the spine which simulates how somebody might do with this type of surgery a posterior foramenotomy has about a 90 to 95 percent success rate in treating arm pain as well as shoulder blade pain. It certainly does not treat any pain that might be coming from a degenerative disc because you're not really touching the disc. And the biggest drawback of a posterior foramenotomy is that because you're not actually solving the problem, there is a revision rate of about 5% uh, per year, meaning that anything else could happen at those levels. You can have a recurrent bone spur or there may not be enough room for the nerve and you have to go back to do something more permanent anteriorly like an anterior cervical fusion. The surgery, again, is typically done outpatient. The surgery itself takes about an hour. Patients stay in the hospital a few hours and then go home afterwards. Postoperatively, we made an incision, so there's obviously neck pain at the back of the neck that usually lasts for a few days. And after five to seven days, a lot of the pain has dissipated and I typically send patients to physical therapy after six weeks and allow them back to the gym in around eight weeks.
Just for comfort, I have my patients wear a soft cervical collar for two weeks as the incision heals, and after that, they can get rid of the collar. There's nothing to really hold in place because, again, it's not a fusion. A lot of people think that by doing just a posterior foraminotomy, there is not an increased chance of what's called adjacent level disease, meaning that there's this perception by doing either a cervical disc replacement or a fusion because you've altered the biomechanics of that one level. Just as an example, if we're doing the lowest level C67, if we fuse that level or done a disc replacement, that it stiffens that level so that the other levels have to pick up the slack and have adjacent level disease, and it just means you have to have surgery one after another. There was a great neurosurgical paper where they looked at a thousand patients that had a posterior foraminotomy, didn't have a fusion, and guess what? The rate of adjacent level disease was exactly the same as doing a fusion. So I don't necessarily think that a posterior foraminotomy decreases your risk of adjacent level disease, but I do think it's a terrific option and the right patient who has a bone spur, doesn't have a lot of weakness, the pain gets better with them leaning forward, and they want a less definitive, less invasive option. Sometimes patients want to try a posterior frame anatomy first before doing something more definitive. That's in fact what Peyton Manning, the football player, had. He had a couple of failed posterior frame anatomies and ultimately had a two-level anterior cervical fusion and then won the Super Bowl. There are a few contraindications to a posterior frame anatomy I like to review. The first contraindication is if indeed there's so much narrowing that more than 50% of the joint has to be resected or the entire joint has to be resected, that's obviously a contraindication because if you resect more than 50% of the joint, the joint becomes destabilized. The other contraindication is sometimes patients have a pinched nerve as well as a pinched spinal cord. When the spinal cord is pinched, you cannot relieve the cord compression just by doing a posterior frame anatomy. You really have to go to the front, take the entire disc out, look at the spinal cord, take the pressure off the spinal cord in order to address the spinal cord compression as well. Patients that have a pinched spinal cord or nerve are probably a better candidate for an anterior procedure versus a posterior frame anatomy. Otherwise, I think the posterior frame anatomy is a great operation, definitely a good option for some patients that have a pinched nerve. Hopefully you were able to understand some of the risks, benefits, and contraindications of a posterior frame anatomy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.